Hello everyone. Welcome to our seventh episode in the series on mineral grinding concepts. My name is Alex Dahl. I'm a grinding specialist and the author of the sagmilling.com software. This video we're going to be talking about some coarse grinding technologies, specifically ag mills, sag mills, and bag mills. As part of this series, we've already discussed specific energy models as well as mill power models. It would be useful to watch those videos either before or after this video to kind of fill in some of the concepts that I'm just going to be running right over in this video as they've already been covered earlier. So let's start by talking about what a tumbling mill is. A tumbling mill is basically a hollow steel cylinder which you feed rock into one end and it discharges from the other end. The cylinder tumbles and there's usually a grinding media inside of this grinding mill which is going to be used to grind down the, the rock particles and cause the size reduction to happen. Now grinding media can be the rock charge and it can be some other media like steel balls or ceramic beads or shaped steel. There's a range of types of mills depending on how much of the media is contained in the charge that's inside the mill. We have uh, on the left of this series, we have autogenous mills where there's nothing but ore in the mill. So these would be the coarse ag mills, coarse autogenous mills. It could also be pebble milling, which we're not going to be discussing in this video. The key thing, ag mills, they have no balls. At the opposite end of the spectrum, we have ball milling, where the mill charge is almost entirely made up of balls. The interstitial space between the balls is where the ore particles can live. Between these two extremes, we have a variety of different mills. We have, first of all, starting from the left, we have semi-autogenous milling. This is where you have mostly a rock charge with some steel balls in it. The rock charge will have some very coarse particles. Those help in the grinding action, breaking smaller rocks. Then there's a barely autogenous grinding mill, which is used in certain applications, which we'll be discussing in the video. Barely autogenous mills are a sag mill where you just keep adding more balls into it. And you end up in a regime where the rock charge that dominates a sag mill starts to be a bit of a mixed charge with lots of balls and lots of rock in it. There's another type of mills we're, gonna, we're not going to discuss in this video are the run of mine mills. These are used uh, mostly in southern Africa. So the focus for this video is going to be ag mills, autogenous milling, sag mills, semi-autogenous milling, and bag mills, barely autogenous milling. So we're going to have to discuss what's going on inside of the mills in order to discuss what goes on with the different types of mills, whether it's ag, sag, or bag. So the mill contains two types of material. Generally, it has rocks and it has media. So according to Sepulveda from his 2008 Prosimen paper, large rocks can be used to grind small rocks. Right, they don't do as good a job as a steel ball does, but it can be used to grind other material. This is the basis for autogenous milling. Coarse rocks are generally not ground by the media. They have to break themselves. So these really coarse particles, and these could be you know, particles the size of a, of a football or a rugby ball, they're, they're going to have to be lifted up and dropped until they break themselves. At the other end of the spectrum, you have very small rocks. Um, you're down here in like the size range of sand. It might be a millimeter or two millimeters. And these are not going to do much grinding themselves. They're just basically there to be themselves ground. And the, the other uh, material in the charge is going to have to cause these small particles to grind fine enough to discharge from the mill. So they are ground by balls. These small particles can be ground by steel balls or whatever other grinding media you have in the mill. 
but they themselves do not break if you lift them up and drop them and lift them up and drop them. So they don't have a self breakage, but they can be ground by the media in the mill, whether that media is coarse balls or coarse rock. Then there's the intermediate size class rocks. This medium size class generally is known as a critical size or it's known as the pebbles. They don't do much grinding and they are difficult to grind with grinding media. The only way you're generally going to break them is with really big steel balls. And they don't generally break themselves if you lift them up and drop them multiple times. So that medium size class, which is often called a critical size class or a pebble size class, these are difficult to grind in tumbling mills. And this is one of the reasons why you will often see a, a tumbling mill in closed circuit with a pebble crusher. Pebble crushers are very efficient at grinding this medium size class. So we're going to quickly discuss a typical grinding system optimization problem that a lot of operations will encounter as they go through their startup and evolution. The objective of the grinding circuit is to produce as much finished material that is suitable for downstream processing as possible. And basically that's going to be your throughput, the tons per hour that you see in this, this equation. The simplest model for power-based grinding system modeling says that the tons per hour is equal to the power generated by the charge tumbling in the mill divided by the ore grindability, which is the specific energy consumption. So tons per hour equals power divided by the SEC. Now, for the purpose of this simplest model, we're going to say that the specific energy consumption is fixed. So if you look at the equation, if you want to maximize the throughput, and if the SEC is fixed, the only way to maximize the throughput is to drive up the power as high as you can. Maximizing power maximizes the throughput. Now, in reality, the specific energy consumption is not actually fixed. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later on in the video because there, there will come a point where you will increase the power without generating more throughput, and that is inefficient grinding. The specific energy consumption can start to drop as the conditions in the mill move outside of the, the preferred grinding range, and that's going to waste power. So if an operator wants to draw power from the mill and maximize that power draw, what are the things that are available to the operator to maximize? You can maximize the filling level in the mill. You could maximize the ball charge in the mill, basically taking up volume in the mill with very dense steel instead of less dense rock. The operator can change the mill speed. There can be some issues associated with that when you're doing sag and bag milling, which we'll discuss. Uh, there's a couple of other things that are relatively minor, like the liner thickness will have an effect on your power draw. As the liner wears down and becomes thinner, there will be more volume in the mill that you can fill with a charge, which will cause the power draw to rise a little bit. Pulp density can have a little bit of an effect because it changes the viscosity of the pulp in the mill, and it can cause the, the kidney to rotate a little bit and draw a little bit more torque. There are some disturbances that will also affect how you draw power from a mill. These are things that the operator cannot necessarily change, but needs to be aware of because they do have an effect on the power draw. So in this equation, we've got the Austin SAG model, which is one of the simplest SAG power models. You can see where the ore density can have an effect on the power draw. There's, uh, it actually shows up in two places in this equation, but, but overall, if the solids density rises, the power draw rises. So putting a more dense ore into the mill causes the power draw to rise. Pulp viscosity is not baked into this equation as a viscosity parameter. 
it's actually in the two empirical constants which are fitted based on uh, surveys from mills. So the K and the A are the empirical factors. The pulp viscosity appears in there and it's not something, again, that, that operators can control. The ore size can have a minor effect and it generally affects the interstitial space that's available for pulp, for, for water and fine material to fit in. So it affects this um, epsilon B value. So the charge levels in the mill. Uh, Royson in uh, SAG 2006 observes that the objective of a high ball charge is to increase the ball charge participation. Okay, you want balls to be hitting rock rather than balls to be hitting other balls. So if you're going to go ch raising or dropping the charge level in the mill, one of the things you're doing, if you're adding more rock to the mill, you're increasing the number of rocks that are potentially going to be hit by balls. And the reverse, if you start dropping the charge level in the mill, eventually you're going to be running the ore level down. The ball level is going to stay basically the same and you're going to end up with ball on ball contacts. Now to draw maximum power, we want to drive the filling level up as high as we can up to a point. There's going to be a point where the filling level starts to overfill and the mill is going to start to behave badly. Mill filling level isn't something that you can generally measure directly in a mill. There are indirect measurements, things like um, sound level and bearing pressure that people tend to use. Although there are now more soft sensors and new instruments that are becoming common that will give you indirect measurements of the filling level in the mill. And these are starting to be used in places where they can now dial in the filling level and keep it at a maximum in order to maximize the throughput without going over that point where you've overloaded the mill. Where does a sag mill become a bag mill? If you're changing the rock level and if you're changing the ball level, you're going to end up in a situation where the amount of grinding that is done by the balls is going to start looking more like a ball mill profile. So here are some breakage rate curves that were published by Becerra and Vicuña in, in Prosim and in Chile. And it describes the evolution of the the grinding system at El Soldado, where originally the grinding circuit was operating as a sag mill, which is basically this blue curve. What you see at the coarse end of this curve is the self-breakage component where coarse rocks are breaking themselves. And that's a pretty typical sag um, breakage rate curve. The blue curve has the, the classical dip that you see where you're going through that pebble size range where the, the sag mill doesn't work very well. And then it rises a little bit and it starts to drop as you move down into the finer particle range. So the typical sag mill is built to maximize this intermediate size and this coarse size but not to do a very good job on the pebble sizes. That's why you go to a pebble crusher. And it's not trying to do a lot of the ball milling duty. Now, in a bag mill, you drive up the ball charge and you end up driving these breakage rate curves into something that looks more like a ball mill pattern that only has one peak. So if there is this, this right-hand peak that you see on the sag, breakage rate curve, that peak has disappeared off onto the right of where these bag mill breakage rate curves are. So one of the things that you do is you drive up the ball charge is you're going to drive your breakage rate curves up and to the right, but you're going to lose that self breakage capability that will break the coarse rocks. So here's another way of looking at the optimum sag conditions. And, and this is a sag grind curve. It was published by Van der Huysusen and Powell, with apologies to Mr. Huysusen for how I butchered his name. 
what this diagram shows you is what's going on in the mill as you change the mill filling level. So the, this assumes that you're holding the, the, the ball charge constant and you're just adding more and more rocks. So what this shows you is that as you raise the filling level, the power draw generally rises and rises and rises. So we've already described that that's a good thing. You're trying to achieve that. But we also said that there's a point where you can drive the filling level up too high and you can see that in the throughput curve reaches a peak and then it starts to drop off. So what's happened at some point in the mill filling is that the specific energy consumption ceases to be constant. You've overdone it and you've gone to the point now where the, the sag specific energy consumption is now becoming less efficient. You're using more power to do less grinding and the throughput starts to drop off. So this is something that, that kind of limits what the, the filling level can be in a sag mill and is one of the things that drives people to add more balls in. If your filling level has a maximum that you can't go beyond, you, you're kind of down to having one degree of freedom left to drive up your, your sag mill power draw, and that's to drive up the ball charge, and that pushes you from the sag regime into the bag regime. So here's a slide from a paper that was provided by Jaime Sepulveda in Prosimin 2008. What this describes is some Chilean mines and their experience going from fully autogenous grinding, you see up on the top left, down to barely autogenous grinding on the bottom right. And, and what Jaime is describing here is what he thinks would be the optimum feed size going into a tumbling mill versus the charge density. So the bag has a high density because it's got a high ratio of balls versus the amount of rock that's in the mill. And your sag mills would be in the middle of this range between the fully autogenous grinding and the barely autogenous grinding. It's important to note here that, again, bag mills, you lose that self-breakage characteristic, which means you need to feed them a finer size in order to be operating efficiently. And again, this, this cartoon gives you a picture of, of one example of what that can look like as you move from fully autogenous grinding to barely autogenous grinding, the optimal feed size into the mill is going to drop down to the 80 to 60 millimeter range, which is probably going to be where you're going to be secondary crushing your feed before it goes into the tumbling mill. So sag mills, Classically, they need coarse material to do the autogenous part of the semi-autogenous grinding. Bag mills, as we've discussed, they can't use coarse material to do grinding. They use balls. So because they don't have any need for coarse material, you don't necessarily want to be putting coarse material into the mill. They can be sensitive to the mid-sized pebbles, and you can expect a high pebble load in a bag mill. One of the things that a lot of operators do is that they don't necessarily track the, the F80 going into a bag mill. They're more likely to track some key size in the feed to the mill. So they might be looking at the fraction of the feed that passes 25 millimeters, for example. Now, if you need to change the feed size going into a bag mill, there's basically two ways you can do it. One way is by blasting finer in the pit, which has the added benefit that it generates more fines. Um, blasting also generates some benefits to the mine in terms of it's easier to load and haul this material out of the pit, assuming that you're dealing with an open pit. So uh, fine blasting works well to try and, and generate more finer material in the sag feed, but there will come a point where you just can't blast any finer, right? You're going to be limited by things like the, the drilling pattern that the miners are able to generate 
there will be a point where instead of blasting energy going into breaking rock, blasting energy goes into just moving rock, creating fly rock, um, cast blasting, things like that. So you can't go too far with the blasting. Go as far as you can before you start losing energy into moving material rather than breaking material. When we're evaluating a sag mill power draw, one of the things we've got to watch out for is what the motor capability is. Now, one way that we can measure this is by looking at what's called a tent diagram. And this is a, an abbreviated tent diagram for the Antipakai sag mill, which has a lot of information floating around in the public domain on it. So I've put the, the sag mill for Antipakai into the sagmilling.com software. And I checked to see what the power draw was going to look like relative to the motor characteristics. So in this diagram, the red line describes what the motor can do as a function of the mill speed. The power draw is going to be maximal at the rated speed of the motor. And this is a, a characteristic that is built in in the factory. And up to that rated speed, the amount of power that the mill motor can generate is linear. The actual power draw in the mill is shown by these green lines. So the green lines are the process power demand. And you can think of those green lines being related to where the charge is sitting inside the mill and the torque that is required to hold it there. So the, when the mill is operating, that's what these green lines demonstrate, is that as you change the geometry of that kidney and as you change the speed that the mill is turning, these green lines will shift. They don't shift very much as a result of liner thickness. I mentioned this earlier, but there will be a minor effect. Now, the key thing with this diagram is you want the green lines to be below the red lines. The red line is the motor limit. The green line is the process power demand, which you can think of as torque. If the green line crosses a red line, the mill is going to trip on high torque or high power or some other limiting thing. So in conclusions, sag mills are more efficient. This is what you should be designing. But as a designer, it's a good idea to make sure the operators have a motor that is capable for barely autogenous operation, which means you know 18%, perhaps 20% ball charge. Design the mill to operate efficiently, which will be a sag operation but allow it to run as a bag mill in case the operator needs that extra capability, that extra throughput, that extra power draw sometime in the future. Sag mills are going to be cheaper to install because they can cope with the coarse feed that comes directly from a primary crusher. That's another benefit of sag mills, lower capital cost. Bag mills are sometimes needed though to squeeze extra throughput through. Now they are going to be lower efficiency, but they can be higher throughput than a sag design. They generally do require finer feed than a sag mill, and this usually means you're going to need secondary crushing. You might not need to secondary crush 100% of the ore. The example at Mount Milligan is they secondary crush about 50% of the ore, and that's enough to give them a, a bag mill feed that they can run at high power draw and at high throughput. So sag is what you should be designing. Bag is what you might need to run the mill as if you need to squeeze extra throughput out or if something else requires a higher power draw than what you're able to achieve in sag milling. So I want to say thank you to all of the authors who have been publishing papers over the years that allow consultants like me to generate these models and calibrate them. I'm also going to link back to some of the other videos that you might want to watch. And with that, I thank you for joining us on Mineral Grinding Concepts, Episode 7. We'll talk to you again in the future. Bye-bye.